Christine, thanks so much for taking the time. I know it's busy. <laughs> And there's a loading going on right now, which has been the case at, at a lot of places we've been, actually. Do you need? <laughs> yeah. Just come back, Mike. Give me 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so just a little bit of background, like, I, and I'm doing the quick spiel before all of these that we start with, just to say the background to this trip that we're doing was really, um, really came from during COVID. Uh, I did an interview with a representative from Neva and in that interview she told me that you know it was over 85 percent i think of the membership would probably go out of business if they if there wasn't some federal funding um which ultimately thankfully they <coughs> achieved and um and we obviously run a music website there are so many independent venues in chicago like really iconic ones you own one here um, and we you know during that lockdown you know we miss live music a lot. It became clear to us how important these venues are. So we wanted to do something just to draw some attention to them um, and hopefully raise a little bit of money. Um, and I wanted to start, like I've started a lot of these, with a bit about you. And um, so this is a super storied venue, obviously, opened in 57, I think. Correct. When I looked, um, it was Doug Weston owned it. So when did you become involved and what drove you to get involved? Nepotism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nepotism. Um, my father became involved in okay. 81 or 82, not yeah. super clear. Um, when I graduated, I'm going to date myself. <laughs> um, and they needed some help at the venue in the office. Yeah. And I took on a part time gig. And here I am, a hundred years later. <laughs> yeah. And were you a musician yourself growing up? I am or, not. You know, no, no. But a music fan? Absolutely. Yes. A million concerts under my belt that yeah. I used to go to all the time. Every yeah. venue. It was crazy. So when was it you started working in the office here? <laughs> um, I started in, oh God, uh, 93, okay. 93, 94. So you were after the huge hair metal like oh was it was it correct still, no yeah. it was it had turned um slowly started turning into more like singers back to like the roots of the singer songwriters yeah um and then they hired um a new kid he was a kid he was like 20 i think he was 22 years old 21 yeah. 22 never worked in the music industry but he loved music like, with a passion yeah um and they brought him on and he was a huge fan of British Britpop and dubstep yeah. and all, and so he started t trying to tap into that market. And then we did a ton of Britpop bands back yeah. then. Um, and then we did also. He was like very Britpop, but then on the other hand, he did a lot of um, harder, kind of like the typical '90s grunge core yeah. kind of bands and things like that. So we started going into like you know more modernization so yeah. to speak so we started doing that and then they finally we try i mean we worked really hard to get the agents to come back to us because yeah. there was like the hair metal time it was it was a difficult i mean it wasn't difficult i mean it, the, the whole scene was hair metal yeah. um and that was just what it was but we got stuck i think into that into that uh, genre too yeah. much and no one saw this venue as anything but. So it took a lot of persuasion and a couple of agents to take chances and sell us a couple of like Brit pop or like maybe a singer song, yeah. even though this room was founded on singer songwriters, yeah. you know, to take a chance and let us do those again. And then it went well, obviously, yeah. because then it started coming back slowly yeah. but surely. But I mean, honestly, it has to, you know, the credit ultimately always goes to, in my opinion, has to go to a lot of the talent buyers that worked here, yeah. um, they were great. There's nothing, I mean, yeah. I have nothing bad to say. I mean, they were lovely people and they've moved on into yeah. their careers, you know, they're doing great things and yeah, it's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, it's such a, because like growing up, and I'll dip myself here as well, I mean, I, I grew up like when I was really getting into music it was like late 80s, early 90s and and it, it was, you know, as Guns N' Roses and all those bands were coming up, that's why I knew the Troubadour. And I know they came back here, right, when they finally... Mm -hmm. But it, 
then looking at it, and, and it's funny, we put up that we were in LA on the socials today, and I took a picture of myself outside the Troubadour yesterday because it was the end point of the ride. And three people immediately commented, and it's because of that film, that Elton John film that was out. Uh -huh. You know, oh, isn't that where Elton John first played? And I'm like, yeah. And it's funny because I always in my head knew the Troubadour as this hair metal place. And it's really started out, I mean, Dylan, like it was a real folk singer songwriter listening room kind of yeah i mean it was definitely like an incubator kind yeah. of space that is what doug founded the place on like he he thought to himself why isn't there a space for these like-minded people whether they're uh musicians yeah. or poetry or comedians because it's all very you know there's like eccentric personalities yeah. and very creative personalities and there was really nowhere at least at that time that really was a welcoming space for them. Yeah. And so he opened it with that thought in mind and then it just became like this, I don't know, haven, playground, yeah. debaucherous, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. But all these people came because they knew they would see something amazing on the stage and to meet other like-minded people and, and, you know, maybe form bands or yeah. discuss ideas or, or, you know, whatnot. Yeah. And it just kind of took off from there at that and time. I, th I think that's... It's interesting now, I've, I've probably interviewed four or five owners and things, and it's th that message is coming out, which is, and you said it there, like incubator, these venues and these like, like four, 500 cap venues, that's, it, we have to have them. Like, and I, I, I guess as I've been going through this, it, when, I, when I first did it, I was like, is it really like a battle between the corporate ownership of venues and these venues and I, we were in Austin and I was talking to Will, I've forgotten his name, the owner of um, Anton's mm -hmm. um, and he's like no it's it's really not like every, everywhere has their place these venues are great for what they are good for and then there is a place for larger venues that, that potentially you corporate own but they, you have to have these venues for musicians to be able to come up in the first place that was what worried me so much about the whole Covid thing because what happens? They're a stopping off point, they're a point, they're an incubator, they're, some people might get their first really reasonable sized gig in a good room in these venues and it's, I hope that over the course of these interviews what comes out is how important they are. Um, I mean they are important. Yeah. They, they are what, no matter what city you're in, what mm. even country you're in, these are the rooms that start these careers. Yeah. These artists had to start somewhere. They didn't yeah. go one day, okay, I'm playing my songs. I'm gonna go do the forum. Yeah. It's not. It's not. That's not gonna happen. Yeah. So these artists. I mean, even there's the smaller rooms, the 250 caps, and yeah. things like that. These rooms are really important. Yeah. Because this is where people get to know them. Like they start off and they they're an opener of three. You know, nobody kind of knows who they are except yeah. maybe they're friends. And then you know you get a couple and like oh. Okay, and then this is where you build your following, and then eventually you headline that room, and then hopefully yeah. you transition to the next, and then to the next, yeah. and then eventually you do do a forum or you know Madison Square Garden. You know, obviously yeah. that is the goal, but you know, without these spaces, how do you get there? Yeah, and what must be amazing, particularly in a venue like this that is so, you know, has been so instrumental in some very big careers. Is you've had a lot of those artists then come back and do. I mean, we mentioned Guns N' Roses, right? Who came and did a show here, which must have been amazing to to be a part of. It was definitely. Um, <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. Everybody was really amped. It, yeah. was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> did you have like millions of friends coming out the woodwork? Like, oh, can I just come down? And I was like, the fire marshal's here. You're, yeah. not, you're not coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we're very fortunate. Also, when you're in a primary market. Yeah. It's, it's you're fortunate in that respect that you do get these artists that want to do a smaller, like reconnect with their fans, you mm. know, kind of thing like that. Step back and be like, oh, I remember <laughs> this. So, so like, it is like a little bit difficult too. You know, they have, their productions are so huge now, yeah. obviously, but they make it work. Yeah. And the fans, you can't get anything better. Like, yeah. I mean, to see whatever band you love that yeah. much, yeah. that close to you, you can't get that. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal, and it's yeah. like it's a definitely reconnection for the artist to the fan, and the fan back to the to the artist. Yeah, like they talk about that forever. That's like they'll see them a million times, but they'll always go, 
the day I saw them in that yeah. small room. I was this far was, away from He it. sweated yeah. on me. <laughs> His sweat hit me in the face. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's you remember this. Yeah. This is what's ingrained into into your head. You know, this is what you talk about. You know, it, it absolutely is. And it's like, I, I remember seeing people from bands, no, maybe not the bands, but people from bands that I loved in small venues in the UK. And it is. The, those shows are still the ones I talk about. And it's... The, the other one, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, I, and I actually got to tell Will when we were in um, in Austin, the first show I saw after lockdown, we just happened to be on vacation in Austin, and um, Lucas Nelson was playing it at, oh, yeah. um, in Austin at Antone's, and Kirst just got in touch with his publicist and said, oh, we're going to be there, can I shoot the show? Yeah, no problem. So we went to that show, it was the first one back, and as I, I said it in the Austin interview, like, I... I remember standing in that room and in a room full of people with live music and he played like Diamonds in the Soles of Our Shoes which he does sometimes as like a an encore and I like had to walk over to the side because I'd missed it so much I was I was almost in tears just seeing live music I guess that that leads me into sort of to talk a little bit about you know we're raising money here for um the National Independent Venues Foundation I don't want to make you go through all of. I know it was horrendous time for independent venues through um, through the lockdown and everything like that. You are a NEVA member. Um, I mean, how did you how did you finance? And I don't want to take you back there, but we talked to a few of the venues, and I like to focus on some of the decent stuff that came out of it, which is, you know, people did pivot. Did you do any like of the parking lot shows or live streams or anything? We like don't that? have a parking. You don't lot. have a parking lot, yeah. We had no outdoor space. Yeah. Um, however, when Neva start when Neva did those streaming yeah. shows, because we're in LA and a lot of these artists were parked in LA, right here, yeah. they did them here, so we got we were able to do those, yeah. which was amazing, and we did a couple of streaming things as well. Um, but that's ultimately all we had yeah. because we have no part. We don't have yeah. outdoor space. So, and in LA, West Hollywood specific, we were literally one of the last places to be allowed to open, to re yeah. reopen again, and have uh, people back into the room. And did you do like the stage? Because I know we went to some shows initially where it was like reduced capacity and everyone was spaced out to start with in this room it doesn't make doesn't, sense yeah. in some rooms it, you can kind of do it but yeah. in this room it made so, no sense so we were just stuck yeah. and I, I mean i guess if you're looking for a, a silver lining and i was talking to um steve chilton mm -hmm. at the at the rebel lounge so he was one of the founding board members yes. right he actually asked me if it was you I was going to be speaking to when we were in LA. Um, but what I said to him was, I guess one of the positives is that there is, that, that Neva is sort of endured beyond, it, it, was, it was set up for that purpose, yep. but it's still there now. So you do have this body that is working for the independent venues, which is a, a really good thing. Well, now we have a seat at the table. Yeah. We never had a seat at the table because little, we had no voice. Yeah. Everybody, no one... When all of this was happening, and they, they were, you know, there were things set up for different various entities yeah. to get some kind of government aid, whatever. There was no thought of the independent no. venue. They're like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> like, it literally had to be explained to the government yeah. what independent venues are. Yeah. Like, it was just like no one thought about it. And honestly, without. The silver lining, ultimately, yeah. from that was that Neva was born because we just all kind of, yeah, we spoke to one yeah. another. We, you know, gave each other, you know, information how it showed, to, you know, yeah. obviously. But that was it. Yeah. Now there's Neva that has our all these independent venues backs when things happen. Yeah. They need assistance. What? And it doesn't have to be a global pandemic. Things happen. Yeah. And just because you're a little, you know, mom and pop, you still need help yeah. sometimes, you know, just like everybody else does. And especially now in these trying times, it's, you know, everything is so much more expensive. Yeah. Everything. And unfortunately, then you raise your prices, which, what does it do? <laughs> goes back to the consumer. Yeah. And they're struggling, you know, to do pay for their own personally, yeah. you know, whether it's rent, gas, whatever, food. You know, so it's just like this... You know, and I don't know what the end will be. 
in the situation that yeah. everybody unfortunately is in these days, but at I least mean, we have a little voice that is able to participate and they're yeah. like, hello, we're here. Yeah, <laughs> and someone says, and I think like in terms of prices going up, people, it's like, you, you know, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. I think yeah. people realize, and that's why I know I keep, and I, people are going to be sick if they watch these series of interviews about me talking about, you know, going to that first show. But it, it like, to me, it, it really, really made an impact on me. Like, man, I've missed that so much. And I think everybody does, right? It was tough on the venues. It was tough on the artists, certainly, as well. And it, But it was tough on the audiences. So I think audiences will be willing to, to come back. The other thing I thought was interesting was, you know, the, the Save Our Stages got pushed through. And I, I was talking to um, Stephen about this, like, with bipartisan support, which today is, like, is unheard of, right? I, I, mean, don't, know, I don't know if it would go through today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, because there is no, honestly, I don't see why it shouldn't have. I mean, no. there is no downside to no, it. What's the downside? Yeah. There was no political angle no. to this. It was like, here we are. Yeah. We're an entity that's been overlooked forever. Yeah. Help us. You're yeah. helping the banks. You're helping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No offense, but yeah. okay. So there was like, okay, this is a, seemingly, it's a good cause. Yeah. There's no, and there was no, I mean, the bottom line is there yeah. was no political ramifications to it. Yeah, no, so I don't think there were. it would make sense because there was, you know. Just like and I think these venues are is such a key part of the community as well. That's the other thing that's come out of it. I mean, I'm sure you have your regulars who come in, regardless of who's playing. And, and we found that that was another thing that came out is, is a, when I talk to people about, why they opened venues. We talked to some people who were really new. Like, we went through Florence, Alabama, and man, I felt old. Like, <laughs> there's a place called For the Record that had opened there. It always surprised me in Florence, you know, right next to Muscle Shoals. We go down there for Jason Isbell's festival every year, mm -hmm. which wasn't on this year, which we arranged the trip around being able to be there for. Um, but, but it always surprised me when I went to that town that there wasn't really a, a venue, like a true just music venue. And these, these guys have opened it up and they're like 25 and 26. But again, one of the things they said, it, it was something else, like they wanted it to be a place where people in the community could go and they wanted, wanted it to be open regularly. We were in Clarksdale as well, that was the other thing. They were like, we wanted the, the community to know that, and the musicians that there's a venue here that is gonna be open that you can come and play at regularly. That was another thing that came out like of, of all these interviews just being there and being open on a regular basis and, and musicians and the audience knowing that. Um, it's important. I mean, these venues do have a sense of community. Yeah. You do have your regulars, but you also have your, in a weird way, you also have your regular artists. Yeah. So every time they, they come through, chances are, I mean, obviously you want them to move up, but yeah. the chances are they're going to come in. Come back come yeah. back to you and it's kind of like oh yeah, yeah you're right thank you for coming back you know it's 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 kind of nice and um in rooms like this you're you know it's a small staff yeah as well so you're wearing a million hats yeah but the thing is it's like you become like a family yeah. too it's not like oh, oh uh, shift number 30 <laughs> it's yeah. not like that so it's it, it's you know you're you're invested yeah and you, like, there's a lot, I mean, we do a lot of shows, and I'm going to be honest, like, I don't get a lot of, like, I'm someone I'm like, oh, like, not my thing. <laughs> However, yeah. you look at the room and you see, like, look how excited these people yeah. are. Look, they're, like, literally singing every word to yeah. every song, and you're just like, holy crap, yeah. that's amazing. Like, it, and that, like, when we first came back and that started to happen, I got to tell you, I was like, <laughs> what a crap. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got, like, really just... It was a lot, it was very emotional. Like, yeah. I'm just like, wow, you know, this is, I missed it. As much as I complain, I complain yeah. all the time. <laughs> um, I really missed it. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was, um, and the first time we did um, a streaming thing. Yeah. I was, I literally stood on the side watching, like, there was like 10 people in the room, yeah. and I was crying. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I didn't realize how much I missed live music. Yeah. It was like, uh, it's, it's like, I'm getting a little emotional. No, but I mean, I, that's I totally the thing, get, yeah. music, that's, that's the, this is the thing about music, and I don't care if it's a small room yeah. or it's like you know a huge stadium. And the bottom line is, it's yeah. like it is. 
it is what brings people together. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it is like you feel it. They they sing. I've said this before. Like that's one song. Yeah. And whatever that song is for you, and it just makes everybody sense. has it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense yeah. to you. You know, yeah. and I'm like, and that's you know, and that's the thing. And then like these when these rooms were closed, like that sense of community was gone. You're yeah. alone. A lot of people, and unfortunately, there were a lot of people alone. Yeah. Stuck. Yeah. And they had nothing. Like. Yeah, you know, obviously you're home, you listen to, you can listen to the records yeah. or whatnot, but it's not the same as being in the room with the people that are getting it, yeah. like you get it, Yeah. you know? It's, you know, and I think that's and was tragic, and I think that's why people are, had such a hard time yeah. as well. Yeah, and I think it's, and uh, I've talked a bit about this as well, and it's something I've seen just doing the trip generally, but also when you're in the room with people experiencing that, you're all there because you love that artist. And it doesn't really then matter. All this other stuff that everyone's worried about every, all day long, like who for that, yeah. left, who's right, who cares about that all that. That one hour Once, or yeah, so, you, that's there. all that matters. Yeah, and it's, the, I mean, the other organization we're raising money for on this trip is, is Musicians on Call, and I, I volunteer for them and as a guide, and, and that, you know, take musicians around hospitals to play for patients. And again, in that environment, when you see the impact that just live music can have on someone who's, probably having one of their worst days it's it's really good so but I guess uh, to, fi to finish off because I know you're super busy I'm going to ask okay. you a couple of questions I've been sure. asking other people so this is a tough one both of them are tough like yeah, I'm not, I'm not favorite do you no, have a favorite memory do you have a fit is there I'm something that really it. sticks out in your mind like is you know when you were stood just watching a show or an artist I mean there's like, so many I, it's, it's unf like that's kind of there's so yeah there's a handful that I'm just like, <laughs> like I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, the two that I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you two. Yeah. Since we were talking about Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. I think it was '96. Oh God, I've dated myself. Um, <laughs> they called, like literally two days before, and they were like, "Hey, see you at a local show. Can we do a midnight play?" I'm like, "What?" <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, anyways, sold the t five dollar ticket. Yeah. Anyways, I the room and when they started playing, all you saw was every kid in that room going boop, boop, boop. Wow. Like I mean, you watched the room and you yeah, just yeah. it was the energy was phenomenal. Yeah. Like it was electric. It was crazy. I mean, I was like, like I still remember, like just watching it, yeah. like wow, like you know, it was pretty cool. And then, um, well, I'm gonna have to say, Stevie Nicks, oh. she came out yeah. for Harry Styles. I I literally stood behind the bar and just cried as she was singing. <laughs> like, I love her so much that it was just like, <sighs> yeah. like I was like, the Queen is on our stage. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't know. So this to me, like these these for me being mm. in a place like this, this is my gratification. Yeah. You know, like I'm just like, every day I'm doing paperwork. Yeah. It's very exciting, you know, very glamorous. <laughs> but then you get those like moments. It's gotta make it work. And it's yeah. totally, it, that you're just like, yeah. okay, okay, I'm good, I'm good, <laughs> I'm okay, I can do this. Yeah. And then we've had a range of answers to this question. What would you say is the biggest challenge of being an independent venue owner? <sighs> just trying to navigate everything all the time, yeah. you know, with the new rules and regulations and 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 tax things and, yeah. and and you know and they change everything and I understand you know mm. in the big picture I get it but as a small venue and you're like literally you're doing 99% yeah. things yourself you don't have like a staff of 50 yeah it's hard yeah and you're just like wait when did that change I'm like wait <laughs> that's a new one I'm like I didn't even <laughs> okay woohoo yeah. like you know and it's it's hard it's 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 just, it's hard. It's very yeah. cumbersome to try to stay on top of it all, all the time. It's funny, I've had such a range of answers, which just goes to prove that you do do everything, right? So, like, the guys at For the Record who are, like, 25 and 26 were, like, getting a liquor license. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a toll, especially yeah. in California. And, that and, is a thing. Yeah, and in Alabama, I think, they, they were, like, after the fact. We looked online, like, where is it hard, the hardest to get a liquor license? Alabama was like was second. It really? Yeah. Wow. And they had like, and then we've had things like um, sound system, getting the right sound system, getting the room set up right. What else was there? Um, or just booking generally. 
So I think we did the rebel, how about, not the rebel. How about staffing? Yeah, staffing, <laughs> yeah. So a whole, like a, a massive range. But I'm glad to hear you say that like when you go in there and have those moments that it's worth it. That's because what, that, that to me is worth it. You guys are important. Like these venues are important. Hopefully, if anyone watches a full series of these interviews, you realize how important they are um, and go to your local venue and watch a show, even if it's someone you've never heard of. You might have the best night of your life. <laughs> you never know. Thanks so much.